I'm not sure why the Dennis the Menace movie doesn't get more praise. Sure, it's a pretty generic family comedy, but it was a favorite of mine growing up, and I actually still find myself really enjoying it. A lot of it has to do with Walter Matthau. I brought my own pillow so I don't get my spit all over yours. Thank you, dear. The rest of the cast is also great, especially Joan Plowright as Mrs. Wilson and Christopher Lloyd as Switchblade Sam. It tries too hard to be like Home Alone at times, but what's wrong with that? At least they had the good sense to let John Hughes write the script. It takes what's a comic book source material and applies it well to a real-world setting, with characters that feel grounded. But aside from all of that, you know what really makes it an enjoyable film? Comparing it against its sequel, Dennis the Menace Strikes Again. Dennis! Dennis, cut it off! No, Mr. Wilson. You're a mess. Dennis! I saw this once growing up, but not much stuck out in my memory. I recently revisited the first movie and found myself surprised by how much it holds up. Oh, poor thing, I wish you'd get that hernia fixed. So I decided to revisit the sequel for the first time in over two decades. And I know, it's silly to critique a kid's movie from the 90s, but in fairness, this movie does hold some significance in comedy history, as it was Don Rickles' last live-action film performance. Nonsense! Nonsense! I thought that couldn't be true when I first heard it, but then I looked it up. It really was his final live-action movie performance. So let's take a look back at the movie that managed to retire Don Rickles from live-action film. I actually have trouble calling this movie a sequel. Despite being marketed as such, it features none of the same cast members, and stylistically, it's way more similar to the comic strip than the first movie, with the comics even appearing in the opening credits. It's clear from the first scenes that this universe is much more zany than the grounded world of the first film. Which I think is actually a good idea. It seems that the creative team knew they were making a different movie, and wanted to try something new. There was this weird trend in the late 90s and early 2000s where kids' movies tried too hard to be like the cartoons that inspired them. Sometimes it worked, but most times it was a blend of two different tones that didn't quite fit together. But I do respect this movie for going in a completely different direction, especially with the Wilsons, casting Don Rickles and Betty White in the roles. I got this new kink in my shoulder, and every time it... Every time I do that, it hurts me. Well, then don't do that. I mean, how do you screw up Don Rickles as Mr. Wilson? Don Rickles is doing his best in this movie. He doesn't phone it in and actually seems like he's having fun. Despite being comedy royalty, he gave his all in the Silly Kids movie, and I have to give him credit for that. Yeah, I know, he got a paycheck out of it but this guy is a class act, and I'd expect nothing less from him. This movie just wastes his performance, as well as the performance of Betty White. Dear, a woman's got to share her man's interests, or at least pretend like she does. That's how I caught George. You did? George Kennedy. I thought if you came along, Dennis would get a chance to ride in an ambulance. <laughs> Brian Doyle Murray and... <laughs> uh, no, uh... The kid from Liar Liar. Yeah, him. Also, I'm not really going to comment on the kid actors in this movie. It's clear there was a lack of direction that makes a lot of their scenes feel stiff and awkward, but I don't blame them. There's a whole side plot where Margaret is trying to win Dennis's affection by trying to be more interested in boy stuff. It's pretty dumb, but I'm not here to dissect the kid elements of the story. How can a girl ever compete with that? Much like the first movie, our story begins with Dennis ruining Mr. Wilson's morning, on his birthday nonetheless. <laughs> Unlike its predecessor though, the sequence is much louder, Dennis! lazier, and dumber. Dennis just doesn't cause a couple of mishaps for Mr. Wilson here. He actually almost kills him this time. <laughs> 
And also, it's kind of ridiculous that Mrs. Wilson hears her husband fall down the stairs and decides to come running in with the giant cake she just made. Like, wouldn't she put it down first? No. She just has to run in with it so this can happen. <laughs> After Mr. Wilson's near-death experience, Dennis's grandfather, played by the great George Kennedy, shows up. That's the red light district. Wonder why Savage is hanging out down there. Sex, Frank? Uh, no, not right now, Ed. Uh, we got work to do. And announces he's moving in. From now on, I'm spending lots of time with Dennis. Every minute! Yeah! Which overjoys Mr. Wilson, because now Dennis will have a permanent target for his elder abuse. What a beautiful day. I'm baking another birthday cake. I should know to make two cakes. With Dennis around, you always wind up wearing the first one. Yeah, well, maybe that wouldn't happen so much if he didn't walk around the house holding birthday cakes. Did you ever think of that, Mrs. Wilson? And this is where the movie starts to quickly get sloppy. Grandpa and George start to go to war with each other. For some reason. And it culminates in a series of bizarre physical jousts between the two. Which are mainly just excuses for poor Don Rickles to mug for the camera. <laughs> Swear. In one scene, he even seems to break the fourth wall to warn the audience about the rest of the movie. You want my advice? Run. Go as far away from it as you can. Save yourself while there's still time. George, that isn't nice. Eventually, Mr. Wilson calls it quits and decides to sell his home and move away from Dennis once and for all. Again, I know, splitting hairs in a kid's movie is pointless, but let's come back to the first movie. It's a silly kids movie, but the characters feel so genuine. The relationship between Dennis and Mr. Wilson feels real, and it evolves throughout the movie. The story there isn't just about Dennis growing up, but Mr. Wilson as well. The movie didn't dumb down its characters to appeal to children, whereas this movie... The real reason these competition scenes exist is because Mr. Wilson has to get self-conscious of his age so that a con man, played by Brian Doyle Murray, can talk him into a phony rejuvenation scheme. I'm sorry, our treatments are still experimental. In five, ten years, maybe, it'll be available to the general public. Ah, little George here, he can't wait that long! Yeah, I can't wait that long! With little help from his sidekick, played by Carrot Top. Oops, wrong person. <laughs> He's hooked all right! I can't avoid discussing him anymore. In this movie, Carrot Top sports a series of elaborate disguises as the professor's second banana. First he's an old man, then he's Dr. Sashi Kashi in a disguise that wouldn't fly today. George, this is my colleague from the University of New Delhi, Dr. Shashi Kasha. Very pleased to make an acquaintance. Big problems! Then the pair later pretend to be mailmen, termite inspectors, construction workers, radon inspectors. Their con starts when the professor talks Mr. Wilson into a procedure to make him feel young again. Which leads to a sequence that I swear is straight out of an experimental film. I mean, who is this supposed to appeal to? <laughs> then the two continue to con the Wilsons out of their money through their various disguises. And you know what? If the Wilsons can't identify Brian Doyle Murray and Carrot Top in disguise, you know, two of the most physically distinctive looking and sounding people on the planet, then they deserve to be conned. Again, I know, kids movie, but I just hate how stupid the comedy has to be here. You know what, let's just come back to the first movie yet again. As a kid, the villain, Switchblade Sam, terrified me. I didn't even realize it was Christopher Lloyd back then, that's how much he disappeared into that role. He personified every conception I had about bad guys and robbers as a kid. His schemes weren't ridiculous either. They were simple and legitimate, which made the character all the more unnerving. But here the comedy has to be so dumbed down that it borders on disbelief. It just makes the Wilsons come off like total morons that they fall for this insane scam. No! You can't sell this house until all these problems are corrected. All of them? That's right. All of them? And despite not being written by John Hughes, this movie quickly becomes more like Home Alone than the first movie, as Dennis eventually stops the bad guys from getting away. Because I guess a seven-year-old has more intellect than several adults. 
Officer George Went then shows up to arrest them. Mr. Wilson, you are a very lucky man. Dennis here has just captured the best con men in the business. Wait, did, did he just say the best con men in the business? These two? I'm sorry. We're very sorry. The youth route. <laughs> what kind of an idiot is going to fall for that one? You'd be surprised. <laughs> Wait, he just said they were the best. Now he's questioning how anyone can fall for their schemes? Alright, someone needs to take the Wilson's car keys away after this. Con men? Of course the Wilsons decide not to move, and the movie ends pretty much exactly where the last one did. I think the reason I find this movie so offensive in its existence is because of how dumbed down the comedy has to be for its child audience. One catastrophe after another! The comedy in the first movie isn't highbrow either, but at least the adult characters behave like adults, and the children characters behave like children. The comedy isn't condescending. Tastes funny. The point of adapting comic characters to live action should be to give them some dimension and depth. If you're going to just treat them like cartoons, then there's no real reason to adapt the material. You're just going to waste the talents of Don Rickles and Betty White on what could have been a voiceover. That's why this movie is truly baffling. It wastes not only great casting, but also just a great opportunity. Nonsense! Nonsense! In doing research for this video, I discovered that there are surprisingly two more live-action Dennis the Menace projects. There was a 1987 movie that has something to do with dinosaurs, and a 2007 Christmas one. I guess I'm bound to come back to both of these at a later date, but I'm just hoping they're more like the 1993 movie than this. Living disaster!